Papa from Ridge. I am um, extremely lucky that each year I tend to visit uh, the Ridge Estates in California every November to meet up with Eric and with John and really chat through and taste through the vintage and the wines. Uh, so these are some of our favorite Californian wines and we always are delighted to offer Montebello each year, uh, which I hope some of you have a lucky glass of. If you haven't been able to collect Montebello over the years with us, you'll be very glad to know that the 2014 is currently on sale. Uh, we also always collect the wonderful Ridge Zinfandels that we adore having. Um, hopefully some of you have got some of the Zins open. I've just spotted that uh, somebody lucky, Roger, you've got Geyserville 2012. Uh, it's fantastic that not only do members love the Ridge Zinfandels, but they also often age them as they're some of the best wines for the cellar. Um, further, without sort of saying too much, I'm going to hand over to Eric because we'll come back to you again uh, towards the middle of this event before we take some questions. Uh, but do send those questions in. Uh, we're delighted to try and get through as many as we can. Uh, so Eric, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. I can see oh, you're going you. for breakfast there. <laughs> yes, I do. You know, <laughs> I'll start my day with some good wine. Um, Great. Yeah, no, it's, it's wonderful to uh, join everyone. I, you know, as much as you love coming out to California and tasting with me after harvest every year, I, I usually make a trip back over to the UK every year, except this is like the first year in a long while that I haven't been able to, you know, with this darn COVID thing going on, I haven't been able to travel hardly anywhere. Um, but everything at the winery has been going well. Everyone here has been safe and staying healthy. We've not had any issues uh, among the staff here. We have had to shut down our tasting rooms and, and have just now slowly started to reopen those. Um, but within the winery, I mean, you just can't walk away from the barrels of wine, the vines outside. Likewise, you can't just step away. I mean, we, we've yeah. had to continue working. Um, right now we're in the middle of the growing season of 2020 and it's looking really beautiful outside. The weather this year has just been stunning. Um, really perfect for, I think, bringing together what will make, I think, a very excellent 2020 vintage. Now, fingers 29, crossed. yeah, I know, fingers really crossed. Because I mean, we're still like a month and a half away from even beginning harvest. So anything can change between now and then. But so far, it's been going really well. Good. It's a, it's a delight to join you. And, you know, we are a big fan of the Wine Society, having been a big buyer of Ridge Wine for all these years. Um, Paul Draper has a, a very good long history and relationship with the Wine Society and Paul Draper is who hired me to join Ridge in 1994. I grew up nearby in the Santa Cruz Mountains on the kind of the west side near the ocean. My dad was a surfer so we had to live near the beach and um, unfortunately I never really took up surfing as much as I love being out in the water in the ocean I just I could never stand up. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, right now, the way the water is, it's so cold, I hardly ever go into the water. And, and now I've got, at the beach where I live, uh, about 40 different great white sharks that have been spotted living there. So I don't ever go in the water now. <laughs> um, but, you know, I grew up nearby. I had a love for wine, a love for fermentation and growing things. And I went to study science at the University of California in Santa Cruz. So I never left the community. I stayed close by, but I got my degree in biochemistry and molecular biology because I thought that was the world I wanted to go into, uh, do pharmaceutical research and, you know, anything in the lab. Uh, that was kind of really appealing type of work, you know, studying DNA and all those you know, proteins. Um, but I wanted to take a year off before committing to graduate school. So I, I took a summer job with Paul, working in the lab, initially working with a chemist who kind of hired me on and, and kind of brought me into the fold of Ridge on the scientific side. And then a year, as I was just getting ready to leave, you know, our head chemist, went on to graduate school. Our uh, production manager, seller master left. And so suddenly Paul was left with 
avoid and a staff. And so I, I volunteered to stay on. And with that, Paul, Paul brought me into the fold of production, of, of tasting with him, helping crush, you know, being totally involved in the hands-on winemaking side of, of running Ridge. And gosh, I, I can only describe it as a vortex. Once you get pulled in, it's like, there's no exit. <laughs> you just <laughs> you're drawn in, and things are moving. You're tasting, and it's exciting, and you know, and then suddenly it's it's your life. And I've now done it for 26 years, and love it. And I can't imagine making a better drug than a beautiful glass of Montebello. <laughs> so I kind of decided this this is the life for me, and I've never regretted not going on to get my PhD and go into the world of biotech. Cause again, this, this is something so much more satisfying, you know, to join Ridge at a time when, you know, Paul was really looking at, you know, trying to expand our global market. So he was on the road a lot traveling. And so he needed someone in place here to learn from him, to really keep the operation going. And, because I, I didn't study winemaking at a school of enology, especially the one that's local, um, UC Davis is well known around the world. You know, the, the approach of winemaking taught by the academic professors there is all about making up for the deficiencies of the grape and using your winemaker tool chest to fix problems, be kind of an analytical chemist when it comes to wine and tasting and dissecting it because I didn't have any of that experience I came to Ridge like a chef and, and appreciation for flavor and and really the approach that, that we take here at Ridge is, is really more of a Bordeaux Chateau you know 1850s all natural fermentation and natural winemaking and and with that we're relying on our palates and taste and, and crafting these wines so yeah. I picked up that ability from Paul. And I guess I had a, already kind of a keen sense of taste. So I could really taste to these minute levels. And you know, I guess that was something that Paul was, was really struck by. And you know, because I had that ability to taste that uh, he trusted yeah. me with, with the operation. And I was able with my, my kind of my German background, you know, of like discipline, order, you know, keeping, keeping the organization running very efficiently and very, you know, precise because that was really what was demanded of me. And, you know, we have such a, a high discipline of our winemaking approach, which is how we come out to the market with these, you know, wonderfully consistent, high quality wines is because we yeah. were really just on top of everything in the cellar. Yeah. And then, over the 26 years, I imagine you've seen huge changes in the vineyards. As yeah, so one of the biggest changes, I mean, of course, is the size of the vineyard of Montebello has expanded. There was a track of land that we had always looked at. It was just like, could we ever secure this land again and restore it back to vineyard? It was a piece of ground that was abandoned after prohibition that was connected to the early winery here. So the Montebello, I mean, the office I'm in, this was built in the 1800s. This was a working winery. It was all lost during Prohibition, shut down. And so a lot of the original land was let go. And Ridge started up in the, the 50s, late 50s and gradually started replanting some of that land. But there was a section of land on this perfect south facing slope that we didn't have access to until just recently we were able to work out an arrangement to reacquire tracts of, of some of the special land. And we're now in the middle of restoring it back to vineyard. So the, the size of the Montebello vineyard, when it's all said and done and planted out, will probably grow about 40% in size. And we're Fantastic. planting. Yeah. And so we're planting to the traditional varieties that we know work very well here in this site. It's mostly the Bordeaux varieties. And maybe we're looking at areas where maybe we can do a little bit more Chardonnay in some of the spots that might be a little too shaded and too cool for, for the Bordeaux grapes. Because, I mean, we love making Chardonnay and, you know, the yes. Chardonnay that comes from the site is so superb. So we'd love to be able to make a little bit more. We would the all other thing, be able to make yeah, more. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds like <laughs> great news. 
Yeah. So the other thing, the the main um, kind of thing that has changed within the vineyard operation itself, when I started, it was all being farmed conventionally. Um, we've since shifted towards organic. So most of the land here now is is organically farmed. And same with our Geyserville and Linton Springs Zinfandel properties, those two estate vineyards, because we own and control them, we've taken on the agricultural risk that goes with organic farming. And with that, we're seeing the vines have adapted to growing in, in a tougher, I guess, I mean, they've, they're healthier vines, but they've had to become stronger and more resilient to the changes of climate and and having gone to organic, you know, there's less protection for them. So they've had to kind of get, get, you know, tougher vines. So you look in this beautiful picture of Geyserville and there you can see the cover crops that's growing. So that's helping bring nutrients to those old vines. And where there's the, the ground's been mowed down under the vines, that has all been done by a uh, special Italian piece of equipment that we can bring through the vineyard to knock down the, the weeds. And where we can't use the uh, Baiano, the Italian machine, we have to do all the weed work under the vines by hand. So that's been the biggest transition in, in converting the vineyard to organic is the amount of labor input has grown exponentially. Um, it's so much more uh, hand work and requiring a lot of very expensive equipment to be able to make organic farming work on such a large scale. Because, you know, there's, there's a lot of people, a lot of wineries in California that have moved towards organic, but they're working with small pieces of ground and, and you know, mm -hmm. can do it easily. We're, we're doing it on a pretty large scale. Back in yeah. Sonoma County, we're, we're the largest organic grower in, in acreage in all of Sonoma County. Wow. So, and, and certainly yeah. here in the Santa Cruz Mountains, I mean, Montebello being the largest vineyard is, you know, it is a, a, one of the, the largest Bordeaux varietal vineyards in California that's farmed organically. And we're doing it on a hillside, which makes it even a little bit another dimension of, of challenge, you know, when you're talking steep slopes. There's something about the mountainside vineyard and the fogs and the cloud that you get in California. How do they differ in terms of the Montebello site and then the Geyserville site? You know, little yeah, little. very, very different weather between the two sites. And that's why we could grow Sono in Sonoma County. We can grow Zinfandel so well. And at Montebello, it's really difficult. I mean, we have an old historic block of Zinfandel growing on Montebello. We make about six to seven barrels of wine from that block. And some years, if it's too cold, I mean, where we're really challenged to even get Cabernet ripe, forget it, the Zin will not ripen. We can't even make the wine. So we're, we're really right at that limit of where you can grow Zinfandel and ripen it here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And in Sonoma County, it's, it can be 10 to 15 degrees warmer there. The fogs are still coming into those valleys where we're growing, but they burn off earlier in the day the, the sun is, is warmer, um, the zen can ripen there. Usually we're harvesting our first blocks of Zinfandel in Sonoma right around Labor Day weekend, so the beginning of September. Whereas down here in, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, that old block of zen, it's usually the 25th of October before it's ready to mm -hmm. harvest. So huge difference of weather between the sites. But it's also the, the weather we have at Montebello is why the Montebello is so amazing because it is so much more moderated by the ocean, the cooling effect that we get with the fog and having elevation, it allows for that really long growing season so that the Cabernet can develop really good flavor and arrive at ripeness at a lower sugar level, which gives us those lower alcohol potentials that we're after. And also the, the pronounced acidity that, that we have in Montebello, which is I think the hallmark of why the wine can age so well. Is it, it, it is probably among one of the most acidic Cabernets made in the world. And it seems to be a real uh, note for Montebello, especially that bright acidity. Yeah. Really pulls it through and shows the elegance. It does, yeah. Sometimes we're always trying to compare um, Cabernets around the world or Bordeaux blends around the world. And of course, being in California, you often get compared to Napa. 
but trying to oh, I know. <laughs> Montebello is to Napa can be. Oh, yeah, nothing <laughs> similar. <laughs> you mean, have to a, climb the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so there's a couple mountain sites in Napa of people who are making wine very similar in terms of range of ripeness. Um, it, even then, the wines are still so different because what we have at Montebello is this exotic terrain of historic, I mean, ancient limestones that formed 126 million years ago and was dragged through tectonic plate movement to this position of North America where it was shaved off and left. And it, it's a rare deposit of limestone. You just don't find limestone in California and you certainly don't find it in Napa. And so where, where you have limestone, especially the, the ancient form we have at Montebello, it, it really lends some of the most amazing nuances of minerality to the wine. So you can really, if, you, if I had a Napa cab here, you could easily tell the two apart. Yeah. And then you touched on the winemaking earlier, saying that you know, it was about not using the toolkit unless you really have to. But tell us. Yeah more about about how these wines are really crafted how you're what you are doing in the winery yeah so it, it's really putting our attention first out in the vineyard so really being in tune with the, the vines every growing season making sure they're not overcropped and that you know they're balanced you know that we're pulling leaves getting the right amount of sunshine on the clusters so that helps with uniform ripening and flavor development and then as we're approaching harvest i'm walking the vineyard um, constantly pulling berry samples, tasting the fruit, deciding by taste, is it ready to harvest? I never look at the chemistry. I mean, we'll, we'll analyze everything in the lab, but I really, I base all the picking decisions on a blind taste of the collected samples, the juice. You know, when I hit, you know, when I see physiological ripeness, that's when we bring the fruit in. And that generally happens right around 13% alcohol with the Bordeaux varieties at Montebello. And once it's brought in, then it's, it's all careful reception of the grapes using, you know, a system that I developed in 2009 and installed. It took me 10 years to develop. And this was, you know, on Paul's pushing me to look at every part of the operation and make improvements where possible to help with bringing you know, the quality up, even if it's 1% a year, just, you know, look at every bit of the operation. So 2009, I installed a, a, a system that we built ourselves and that conveys the fruit to a December. The December then breaks off the whole berries, which then sends them onto sorting equipment below. And we feel that, you know, there's, there's all this talk of optical sorters that, you know, every first growth in Bordeaux has and every top Napa cult producer has. We, we feel that that sorting takes it a little too far. You can over sort and start to strip away some of the really fine nuances of terroir. And so we'll sort, but, but it's our visual, our optical is just looking at the fruit moving in front of us and pulling out stems, little green peps, raisins, um, we'll save little lizards that might have accidentally come from the vineyard. We'll remove yeah. those. <laughs> and so we don't oversort in any way, but we do look for anything that might add to the er already herbaceous quality of the fruit that we have at Montebello because it is a cool site. And so, you know, we're, we're going to try to pull out stem fragments. And so once the fruit's collected into a small fermenter by picking block by block sub parts of the block may come in one day, we may go back again a second time and pick a couple of days later, another section of rows. So we ferment everything apart. And the same goes with the Zinfandel vineyard. So everything is picked by taste and we break up the vineyard into all these distinct parcels, ferment them in their own tanks, carefully work the skins as the natural yeast that travel in on the fruit start to ferment. We're doing remontage and we're just pumping and gently irrigating the cap, tasting as we're deciding how much more remontage to give. Because every vintage, the amount of tannin content is gonna vary. So we wanna come out of the fermenter with a consistent quality of tannin structure 
And, and we only get that by being very conscious of the tannin extraction and tasting, pressing off, not going too far and making wines that are just too aggressive. We mm -hmm. want to have elegance. We want to have drinkability. We also want to have ageability, especially with Montebello. Yeah. And so there has to be a certain amount of tannin to make sure that the wine can be carried for the decades in the bottle. But, but every crucial decision is by taste. Once the press is loaded, then we fractionate. So as, as the bladder press is squeezing harder against the skin, we're collecting fractions. I taste those and decide which of the five fractions can go back. And that again, by taste. And then that lot, that wine, that cube is sitting in tank waiting for the natural malolactic to get started. Once we see that that's going, then we send it to barrel. And, and basically all the lots stay apart for a various amount of time. And then we begin the assemblage process much later in the year. So well after harvest, after the wines have had some time to settle out and then we start tasting, it's all blind tasting. You know, every year we go into the assemblage trying to keep all our prejudices out. So in blind tasting, as we're tasting the ingredients of the vintage of that particular single vineyard, we don't know what glass corresponds to what piece of ground in the vineyard or what mix of varieties. And so we're tasting for typicity. We want to combine the best cues of the year to make a really wonderful example of a Geyserville or a Montebello or a State Cab. And so it's, it's a lot of very careful tasting. And that's where Paul, Paul still is very involved in that. He loves, I mean, the, the ability to sit and taste and see the success of the year and how the pieces have come together and whether or not I, I did well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he still wants to, to watch over me, which is good. I appreciate it. I mean, we, it, it's so really, how, yeah, it's good to how have. How long it. can that, oh, sorry, you go, Eric. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, it's good to have a full team of tasters doing that because we're all blind mm -hmm. tasting. We all come in with our own sensitivities towards different flavors, different tannin texture. And, and so it's, through the blind tasting of us all coming together with some kind of consensus that we can actually make a, an assemblage. And it's with everyone's input. It's a democratic process. You know, it's something that no one really go, goes into it knowing how the blend is gonna come together. And, you know, I don't try to force my opinion over the others and Paul doesn't like to force his opinion. We really want everyone to participate in it. And usually when we're beginning the process of assemblage, the newest member of the team is the first person that has to start talking about the wines and why they voted a certain way. And we go around the table and as you get more and more senior, you get to the other end. And then, you know, I'll, I'll talk, Paul will talk. And then, you know, we do it that way because we don't want to have any influence on anyone else's posi position on a particular glass. You want that everyone that to... feels like a baptism <laughs> of fire for the purple. <laughs> <It> goes first. <laughs> it is. Well, there's no bad wine in the selection, so um, <laughs> yeah. we justified answers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. How it, long it, it, can that period that take? How long does the blending take? Oh, it could go on for months. I mean, we start off very <laughs> conservatively. We may make a very small first assemblage of Montebello, a very small first assemblage of Geyserville. And then as time goes on, as we get to maybe the first racking in winter, we'll continue to add more parcels to the blend as, as we see them really come together and, and settle out. And yeah, so it's, very, it's done very carefully. Because once yeah. you make the blend, it, it's committed. And if you commit to making something that didn't really have stability, it can really alter the, the character of the wine. So we do it really slow and very, very cautiously. And then how, and we don't, yeah. how long do the wines typically stay in barrel? You know, anywhere between like 12 months. If it's a very fruit forward, easy drinking Zinfandel, it doesn't necessarily need another three or four months in barrel it can be bottled at 12 months get some bottle age and then go into the market if it's a more structured zinfandel like geyserville can be pretty pretty serious wine it it can 
you know, go out 15 months in barrel. And Montebello for sure, 18 to 22 months is the general time, time frame of barrel aging. Same with the estate cab, because that wine there being from Montebello from various parcels, the idea of that wine is softer, more integrated tannins. That's the Cabernet that you would begin drinking in the kind of first 10 to 15 year period while you wait for Montebello to get some development. And so we're really careful about making sure that those wines have time and barrel to help the tannin resolve. And we're using American oak. So that's one thing I've not changed at all at Montebello. I didn't come in with this idea, oh, French oak is superior. We've got to only use French oak. No, I, I came here and I just, I have a, a strong flavor appeal for um, American oak and what it can do for the wines. And I love the effect that it gives Zinfandel. Because then, just by its nature, the grape has just got such beautiful flavors. You know, it's got a, an inherent spice to it, especially from old vines. It's what we call the old vine spice. And so then you throw an old vine Zinfandel blend into an American oak barrel. It just takes the wine to a whole nother level of pleasure. It imparts a, a nice exotic spice, a sweetness. It, it makes the Zinfandel so much more drinkable. And then same with the Bordeaux varieties. I mean, I, I absolutely love tasting Montebello out of American oak barrels versus French. I mean, I always have a few French here to compare to. And when you go to those French barrels with Montebello, you taste and the wines are, are so much more covered by a French oak character that it, it's really hard to see through it to see the Montebello notes. It's like the okay. French oak is over, overtaking terroir. You go to an American oak barrel, it's like that is Montebello. It's perfumed. It's very open and revealing. And I love it. <laughs> so I've never changed that. If anything, I mean, I've maybe have, I've tightened up the source of the oaks that we're using. I've moved us more towards an older forest in America that's along the East Coast, so the Appalachia Range, you know, mm -hmm. versus where, where when I started here at Ridge, a lot of the oak we were using was mostly from the Ozarks. So faster yeah. growing trees, richer soil, and they would have more impact on the wine. So with Appalachian oak, it, it seems to integrate much finer. I mean, you've tasted the barrels when you've been out here and, and it's, I think it's just stunning to see the difference. Me, it always amazed me, Eric, your knowledge of the American forests. So the, yeah. the different impact that those different uh, oaks from different regions or different states would would have on your wine because yeah. i think frequently we can talk about french oak and its different origins mm -hmm. but we talk about american oak and the various origins very very often so to yeah no i believe strongly that there's a terroir to the oak forest in america just as they've been talking about for france for all the all these years you know transol versus you know you know, Limousin and, and Allie and Vosges. And we've played around with all these different forests with French oak. And we've done the same with American oak because we know it has an impact on the outcome of the wine. And, and with every year, based on how the oaks are working with Montebello or with Geyserville, I can refine the cooperage for the next vintage. And so every year there's a push working with our coopers on their sourcing, their seasoning time, their coopering techniques to just keep pressing the quality higher and higher. Ultimately, what we don't want to make is wines that reflect the art of barrel making though. So what we're after are the barrels that really kind of weave their way into the flavor of the wine and, and play a secondary role. You know, we yeah. still want to be able to take that glass, open the bottle and smell Montebello but yet on the palate, it's some of the beautiful flavors of, of what the American oak can do for the wine. And I think, you know, 100% of the time, you're currently uh, making that work. So that's yes, yeah. the walk between smelling oak and smelling grapes and great wine and terroir is something that uh, with the ridge range, it sort of handles it perfectly. Yeah, well, for all these years, I mean, the founders of Ridge, Back in 59, the group of scientists that discovered Ridge or, or came together as a partnership buying an, an old historic winery on this mountain, they came together making first Montebello Cabernet. And they just 
love the idea of making wine and making wine in the more European model, wines of place, keeping the varieties apart, not taking the Zinfandel that they started to bring in and blending it with the Cabernet. No, they, they really were intrigued by the idea of making wines a place. When Paul Draper joined in 69, he just continued to push that same approach and, you know, that philosophy. And so for all these decades, everything we've done, I mean, the huge range of wines that we make, they're of distinct place. And you know, I mean, sadly, it, we don't send so many of the, these really small lots over to the UK, but, you know, there's all these little old, you know, five acre parcels of hundred plus year old Zinfandel vines up in the Russian River Valley and we'll bring the fruit in and make it and it's going to taste so different than Lytton Springs, so different than Geyserville and all the other zins we make. And, mm -hmm. and we do that for like all 35 wines that we make. Everything yeah. does taste distinct and different. And, you know, part I, of, part of, you know, our winemaking approach is to be very elegant and delicate with the wine and winemaking and not overly rely on oak and do things and play all these tricks in the winery to alter the character. So that's why we even do ingredient labels. So you can actually look at the back of the, the bottle and really see what all was involved in making the wine. Yeah. So it's truth in uh, our philosophy. And so I think you know, your labels have always, uh, always been um, quite iconic in the amount of information that they give, but also in their style and format. Yeah, well, we're making wines for for like the true connoisseurs that really want to know what went into that particular vintage. And, and nothing to hide. Nothing to hide, no, not <laughs> at all. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Now I should ask Eric, what's current in your glass? We haven't- Oh, I got, yeah, so I got the beautiful 14 Montebello. Fantastic. So this is what we're currently year. selling. Yeah, yeah. So Will you tell year, us a little bit more about it? How's it looking now? Oh my God. I mean, the moment I pulled the cork, it was like my office just filled up with the perfume of Montebello. Oh yeah, it's just absolutely stunning wine. So this year's blend is a very classic, you know, uh, kind of sapage. I mean, 75% Cab, 18% uh, Merlot, looks like 5% Franc, 2% Petit Verdot. So we grow those four varieties. I mean, Cabernet Sauvignon is the dominant grape in the ground acreage wise on Montebello. We grow it between 1300 foot elevation on up to 2700 feet, mostly on the south facing slopes. We've got scattered among that range of elevation, eight parcels of Merlot. We've got two blocks of Cap Franc, two blocks of Petit Verdot. They're all harvested at different dates. They come in, they go into their own fermenters. Um, generally, it takes about five weeks to harvest all the different parcels of Montebello and work through the ferment, get them to barrel on their own. And then through the blind tasting, we pick and choose. And so we never really know what the final sapage is going to be because, I mean, it's all just blind tasting. And then at the very end, once we get to our final glass, and we confirm it by tasting the prior vintages to see how does the new vintage fit, then we could confirm and say, okay, this is the mix. But generally Montebello's have a fair amount of Merlot as a second grape. We love what that grape will do to the Montebello tannins. It really helps kind of bring a suppleness to the mid palate. It brings the nose up. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon on its own, as wonderful as it is, it's got a very solid backbone, dark fruit, it can be pretty austere. So the, the bit of Merlot that comes into the blend really kind of smooths out the rough edges of Cab. Franc, yeah. I love for its aromatic. It's more of a medium weight wine, so it's not adding structure and weight. It's in, in fact just helping bring the perfume notes up in the glass. And then Petit Verdot is like Petit Syrah for Zinfandel. It is dark, inky. It's got the violet notes, the licorice, the fennel. I mean, a little bit goes a long way in a blend. So 2% is kind of perfect amount. Now, you know, 13 Montebello, you've got the really <laughs> vintage there. You know, you can see just what a difference of a vintage does. So in 13, it was not a year for Merlot. In fact, Merlot is, I think, 5% of the blend. 
you know, the second grade yeah. is a petit verdot, 10%. It is, 8%, yeah. Oh, 8%, yeah, so. It's the just, difference you know, the between difference. those two vintages. Yeah, it's just the growing season. You know, we were in yeah. a serious drought from 2012 through 2016. The worst of the year was uh, 14. You know, we had a third of normal rainfall and the vines were just so struggling. And, oh, uh, I mean, the, the Merlot vines were the ones that really seemed to really hold it together and, and get to ripeness with no water stress issues. Whereas Petit Verdot gave up. That's why there's so little Petit Verdot in the, the 2014 is it's the most sensitive yeah. grape to climate change and weather variation. So if it's too wet, it won't ripen. If it's too dry, it just kind of falls apart on the vine. So it's just, yeah, it's just the difference of a year. It's the Goldilocks of, of the yeah. grape. <laughs> it is. Yeah. But the 14, the 14 is just amazing. I mean, this is just beautiful. Uh, I mean, it's at a really good place in drinking right now. Yeah. And how really long do you the 14? Well, they, you know, we all kind of give some guidance on the back label. I say 30 years, but, you know, it's plus or minus, you know, five to 10. I mean, yeah, we kind of are a little conservative. Like we, we would like people to drink up their bottles before they're too far out. Um, mm -hmm. But but I definitely see that this that most vintages of Montebello can go on for 50 years. They will yeah. reach different points of development. And they may start to go into tertiary notes as they approach 40 years. But if you're a fan of those type of flavors, which I am, I mean, there's nothing better than like a 59 Pichon Lalande <laughs> I mean, for just those type of flavors. <laughs> yeah. 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 But of course, interesting because the 14, I tasted it quite recently before we put it on sale. And of course, it is looking mm -hmm. great now. Like it's amazing. Oh, yeah. in its youth but also the aging capacity that it has it's remarkable it and is yeah eric i'm going to have to interrupt us because i can see that we've been flooded with questions on the q a oh yes yeah so yes. i'd love to get some of the members because i know that they're, they'll be very keen to have some of the specifics answered we've also okay. seen members drinking a wonderful array of older wines so we've seen oh, like, that's great to hear Isabel, yeah oh six guys of ill I've seen a few Montebello's dashing past in different vintages. So it's um, right. glad everyone's having a glass of something. Well, I love the Wine Society and all your members. I mean, <laughs> appreciating wines with some age. I mean, yeah. that's, I mean, that's why I fell in love with the wines here at Ridge and, and why I've stayed on. It's just, you know, the, the wines age so extremely well and those flavors that come out with bottle age are just so fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Hey ho, Emma, I can see you on screen. Yeah, we've got Go some questions coming in. So the first question is from Alan Johnson, who's going to be asking himself. So I'll pass over to you, Alan. Okay. Hi, Eric, thank you for a great presentation. I had a lovely visit uh, up in Lytton Spring Roads last year, very welcoming, very informative. Uh, actually, you, 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 you just touched on answering my question when, when Sarah asked something similar recently. Uh, it's about aging potential, particularly of Montebello. Now, I know that everyone has a different view on, mm -hmm. on optimal times, but if you were to give us your own view of a, an optimal drinking window for oh, yeah. Montebello. I, I have some 06 downstairs, so thinking about okay. that. Yeah, no, that, that's a good vintage to be thinking about drinking right now. I mean, it's a vintage of the six. Um, gosh, I'm, I kind of believe in this vintages repeat on 10, and if not 10, 20 year cycles. Like I see a lot of the 96 quality of flavors in the 06. And I mean, between the two, I would be drinking the 96 right now. The six could still use a lot more time. I mean, for me personally, I love the flavors that evolve in a Montebello when they, they do get to that 20 year mark. They just really start to show more of the minerality because a lot of the primary fruits will have subsided and more of the secondary notes and more of the wonderful earth limestone character comes through, the tannins soften. Yeah. 
and there's just some really sensuous flavors that that emerge at that point of age and then once they kind of hit that that 20 year mark of flavor development they kind of sit on that plateau and can go on indefinitely like what we've seen with the 91 vintage that's now well on that that point of that plateau but it's holding and you could go back to like 1984 1985 they're still sitting on their plateau 78 now in the early years there was a lot more variation vintage to vintage because the vineyard wasn't as large they didn't have as much merlot to blend with until 19 74 was their first vintage of including Merlot in the blend. So they were a lot more susceptible to the wear, weather variables in those early vintages. Whereas today where we are with a, a much more complete mix of varietals to work with and we're growing at all these different points on the mountain, each with their own microclimates, they kind of can even out if we have a tough year with weather, there's going to be some spot on the mountain that's going to give us that perfect weather to make a really good Montebello. And so I think going forward, we're, we're really gonna see with pretty much any vintage now Montebello age abilities out to 50 years because of just the diversity of, within the vineyard of what we have to work with. Mm -hmm. And Eric, if I was to just add to that, if you said 20 years for the Cabernet, so for Montebello, is yes. there an easy for some of the Zinfandels? Oh, uh, you know, yeah. I still love Zinfandel. You know, you can always, I mean, the whole idea of working with Zinfandel originally at Ridge was that, you know, they, Cabernet with its backbone of pan and would need bottle age. Zinfandel would be a variety that consumers of Ridge could in, enjoy and appreciate earlier. And so that was really what set them on this path of, working with the two varieties to, to make a wine that consumers could drink, you know, in the first 10 years while they waited for Montebello to get some bottle age. And so, you know, I wouldn't say that some of those early vintages of like Guides of Owen Springs were really drinkable in those early years because they were being made the same way as Montebello and they were coming out with some serious structure. That's why you can still drink the 73s and the 74s today they had probably when they were young wines, just as much structure and weight as a serious Montebello. Yeah. But, but I would say in general, I mean, because now we have a, a much wider range of different vineyards to work with, like the East Bench, we've got Zinfandel that comes from Paso Robles as well. Those are pure Zen. They're not made to be seriously structured. They're all about fruit and early drinkability. You can start with drinking those wines in the first five years and they're just beautiful wines. Then you yeah. kind of road, you, know, you move into Lytton Springs, Geyserville after they've had about five to seven years of age. And then yeah. they're at their sweet spot of drinkability and, and they will improve with bottle age. I mean, there's nothing better than a Geyserville that's got 20 years of bottle age. But you know, if you don't have that patience, then you know, you, you can drink them up in the first 10 years yeah. and, and it's I was fine. also going to say, I'm sure you could pair it with some, some good steaks or some good uh, protein rich food to- Yes, yes. Younger wine. Oh, well, Emma, yeah. I know we're being too long on these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, it's absolutely fascinating. So um, <laughs> the next question is on, um, it's just a quick one on climate change. How do you feel that climate change is, um, well, has affected vintage variation? It's variation, yeah. It's just seeing us going from drought to flood to drought to flood. I mean, in quick succession from one year to the next, I mean, having floods and, and mudslides and the road washed out and then the next year, no rain. I mean, it's just this crazy um, weather variation. I mean, seeing our hottest days hotter, coldest days colder, wind at times of the year when we didn't have wind. I mean, it's, it's making it more tricky in the vineyard. Of, of navigating mother nature and all these weather variables, you know, having, you know, the crops get hit by rain during bloom one year and then other crops the next and having to trim back. And it, it's just requiring so much more watching over the vines 
and, and being on top of it. But luckily we've got a viticulturist that's been with Ridge even longer than I've been at Ridge, David Gates. Uh, he's been here since 1989 vintage and he's, you know, he's been through it all. So he knows what to watch. He's like the vine whisperer. He knows what the vine <laughs> means. <laughs> so we've been very lucky and very fortunate of navigating through these weird weather variations with with him watching over the vines and uh i mean he really you know he he provides me the fruit that is easily able to become great wine you know without that i mean then then i have to look at my tool chest if i'm dealing with fruit that's subpar that is lacking then there's really for 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 us a ridge i mean we have no patience for that so if something comes in and it does not make great wine it's out the door on a tanker truck to be sold off to some other winery that's going to blend it away where they can then use pan and powder, mega, cu mega purple color additive and whatnot. But <laughs> we're not going to do that. I mean, we're only going to work with things that are going to make top wine from the start. Yeah. And that's why we really put our most intense efforts in the vineyard and only work with the best land. So so, you know, working with sites that, that we know will produce quality consistently year after year. And the best of those vineyards are then owned by Ridge, where we've made a commitment to preserving those, those vineyards forever. So Montebello we own, Lytton Springs, Geyserville we own. You know, we, after decades of working with those sites and seeing how consistent the quality is from those old vines, we've we've made the investment in owning the land and we'll be able to make those wines forever as long as ridge continues to operate which i hope is forever i mean and the other thing to say is that i'm trying to make wines also that i can live long enough to enjoy and you know makes it makes me exercise every day watch my diet because i want i want to be able to drink this wine in another 25 30 years <laughs> Love yeah. it. So yeah. our next question then is um, from Graham Finch and he's asked, do you have a mix of old and new oak barrels? And if so, how do you decide on the ratio for each wine? It depends on the wine at assemblage. So we really look at the flavor intensity, the tannin structure. And so if it's a richer vintage for Geyserville, I can often put it into a higher percentage of new oak where it can integrate nicely. Uh, maybe you use 20% new oak, the other 80% will go into a small amount of one year barrels, some two year, three year, four, five. I'll tend to go out to about six or seven year old barrels with the rest of the wine. And at every three months, as we bring the wine up out of the cellar, obviously as we're decanting the barrels off the sediment, we'll recombine all the different age barrels into one tank and I'll taste the, the blend and see how the oak is working with the wine. If I feel that the oak is a little too dominant, then in returning the wine back to barrel, I'll refill less of the new and more of the older, just so that we're not going to gain any additional oak character. So we're tasting along the way as the wines are going through Elevage and making adjustments with the proportions of new oak and, and older cooperage. Now, the only wine at Ridge that's 100% new oak is Montebello, the Bordeaux blend. It's been that way since 1987. And we feel that the, the Bordeaux grapes in general can always incorporate a higher percent of new oak. And because of all the work we do with the, the selection of barrels that we work with, we're looking at integration. We wanna make sure that the barrels that are coming into the cellar even though it's 100% new oak going into the wine, we want the oak to still incorporate itself into the flavors of Montebello very well. And so it's, it's adding to the, the richness of the wine. It's doing some really wonderful things for Montebello. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, it's rapid fire questions at the moment. Our next one comes in from Jan de Clare. Um, Jan, are you there? I am indeed. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, the question I had, Eric, it's been wonderful to hear you talk about the identity that Rich has. That's been fascinating. Um, 
I'm interested in, in asking you if you would be able to describe the characteristics of the vineyards, particularly Lytton Springs and Geyserville, and mm -hmm. maybe some of the sort of differentials in those vineyards? Yes, yes. I mean, the two, that is probably the most perfect study of terroir. Those two Zinfandel vineyards, their sites are in very close proximity. They're only about a mile and a half apart. They lie in two different valleys of Sonoma County. So Lytton Springs is in the Dry Creek Valley and Geyserville is in the, the valley just to the east in the Alexander Valley. And they have very different microclimates. So they're geographically very close, but weather-wise really different. There's a greater amount of heat hitting the vines at Lytton Springs. Because Dry Creek Valley is a deeper valley. It's more protected less fog from the Pacific can travel into the valley. And so the fog that comes through will burn off really early. And the temperatures there can be five to 10 degrees warmer by the afternoon. Whereas Geyserville is a lower lying valley that has a greater connection to the ocean. And so the fog will come through, hit those vines earlier in the day and stay longer. And so the nighttime temperatures there will drop lower and which has a huge impact on acidity in the grapes and really preserving the acidity. And so when you look at the acidity between the two wines made, you see it really, you know, the Lytton Springs is more of a typical Zinfandel, higher pH, really beautiful tannin richness and flavor development because of the extra warmth that's there. The soil is, is a lot of ancient clay that's been laid down through erosion. And so with clay, you also get uh, more interesting minerals that you can taste in the wine. It's almost like you can almost smell in a Lytton Spring some like pottery, just some of that clay, ferric quality, the iron that's in the clay. Geyserville is in an alluvial ancient riverbed. So it's well-drained, it's gravel, granite, decomposing granite. And those vine roots go down deep into that, that strata of river rock and draw up from it a totally different set of minerals. And so when you taste the two, they really have such a, a difference of character. Also they're historic vineyards. They're all you know, vines that are hundred plus years of age. They're all dry farmed. You know, we only work with sites where we know that the, the soil has the capacity to hold winter rain. And that's what sustains the vines through the, the summer months. We don't see summer rains in California. So we're really counting on the soil holding on to the winter rain. And so the vine roots, by having dry farmed them all, you know, these years, they, they're trained to go deep into the rock and into, through the clay and draw moisture from it to sustain themselves. And by dry farming, you have a way of really like amplifying the effect of terroir you really see it much more strongly in the fruit and in the wine. And, you know, they, they are really, again, the, the, the most two perfect wines to study the terroir effect of, on Zinfandel in California. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, the next question is for Sarah. So you get a little bit of a break, Eric. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay. You can have a yeah. glass of wine. Yeah. Um, Sarah, there's a lot of people asking when the Zins are coming in. <laughs> mm -hmm. in well, I, have, I have good news, but I also have uh, news for, I guess, this group only. So usually we sell the Ridge Zinfandels in the very beginning of January or the very end of December people might have seen the mixed case going out quite frequently but this year we have actually been able to buy a little bit more Zinfandel from Ridge um, and we're going to be selling them in uh, November so hopefully they will go out in the autumn uh, it'll be October or November it'll be by email oh, and, then perfect. Online. Yeah. and so they'll be ready before Christmas which will be wonderful for people and it's the 2018 Zinfandel, so we will have Geyserville, Lytton Springs, and East Bench. And Eric, oh. would you mind talking a bit about the 18 vintage? Yeah, yeah. No, I know the boat was loaded just not too long ago to get these wines over to you. Fantastic. <laughs> so they're on their way. Uh, I mean, talk about a vintage. I mean, 18 was, it is the Goldilocks vintage. That's the, the best way to describe it. Everything was perfect in terms of how much rain and the rains ended. 
the crop size wasn't large, but it wasn't too small. The vines were in just perfect balance. And with that, with that kind of weather that we had through summer where it wasn't too hot, it wasn't too cold, we didn't see too much fog either. It's just, we never saw really high temperatures, which can really unravel ripeness in Zinfandel. If you get a heat wave right as you're going into harvest, it can send the, the sugar numbers through the roof and then you end up with the really strong, porty-like quality of flavors. We didn't have any of that in 18. So the, the, the uniform ripening was just so wonderful and it's rare to see with Zinfandel. And so you see it in the flavor, the texture of the wine, the tannins are ripe, the flavors overall just are really deep and really sensuous. I mean, it's really, I'd say one of the most seductive Zinfandel vintages we've had since probably the legendary 97s. Yeah, it's rare. Again, it's really rare to get that with Zinfandel. You're always, up, especially with global warming and climate change, I mean, Zinfandel seems to be having the biggest fit with that. And so you see yeah. Zin going riper or less ripe year to year. Whereas 18, it was just like, it hits the perfect mark right in the middle of ripeness. And they are really some of the best wins. That's what I've been drinking uh, a lot of lately. Yeah. I have to say, tasting the samples, I was blown away. So I'm so glad that we were able to get a little bit more this year and, yeah. and offer them to members. And I think we will be offering them in our usual mixed six, where we do two of each of those vineyards and put oh, it in good. a case. Drink one early and then take save one. Now, if you like, like your first bottle, you might want to buy some more. That's what we always tell our customers <laughs> here who are on these small lot subscriptions that you get your shipment, taste your first bottle and decide if you like it because, you know, it's going to sell out fast. You better order it more <laughs> if you want it. <laughs> well, I think we, we always seem to sell out fast when it's Ridge Zins. So that's yeah. definitely his word. <laughs> Just yeah. um, say one final question because I'm very aware of time. There are a few people asking, what is the East Bench Zinfandel? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think that's yeah. part of your, your mix, isn't it? So that's, again, it's another vineyard that's in close proximity to Lytton Springs and to Geyserville. Now, it sits a little bit deeper in the Dry Creek Valley up on this bench land overlooking the rest of the vineyard. It's an old piece of land that was let go after Prohibition. It turned over to kind of pasture land for, for cattle and horses to graze. We, we took over control of it in the late 90s and restored it back to a Zinfandel vineyard. And in planting it, rather than doing kind of the classic mixed planting of Zinfandel, Petit Sera, the other blending grapes, we kept it to just pure Zinfandel. So we can make a, a unique wine that really captures the beautiful flavor of just Zinfandel, Dry Creek Zinfandel. Now we didn't plant it to just one clone. We did a selection massage. So we took cuttings of our favorite heritage selections of old Zinfandel vines from our favorite site, transplanted them there and have been making this wine as a single vineyard since 2006. And as those vines are now getting some good age on them and having really moved more towards dry farming, they're really starting to show a really beautiful personality. And their soil is, is this really deep, rich red terra rosa. High clay content, but really deep red with, with iron. It's a really ancient mm -hmm. soil. And so when you taste that wine, you really do see a lot of pottery-like, you know, kiln, you know, freshly kiln, kiln uh, pottery elements yeah. in, the, in the wine. The beautiful wine, but but when you taste it, you don't get the effect of Petit Sera or Carignan in the mix. It's just pure Zinfandel. Thank you, Eric. That was a wonderful description of the three yeah. Zinfandels, and absolutely, I I always adore talking with you about your wines. So I'm very glad we got to do this, despite the fact that I've not been able to jump on a plane so far this year. I know, same here. I really I'm miss it. I love going to the uh, UK. It's there's so much to see and so many great restaurants and ah uh, well it'll all be over soon it will Hopefully. it will <laughs> but um i should probably wrap us up because it's eight o'clock but um in the uk at least and we have had our hour of your time that i know is very precious yeah. um i want to say 
Firstly, a huge thank you to the tastings team. Thank you, Emma, Catherine, and Anna from behind the scenes. Um, I want to tease members a little bit here because I've got to say that if you are a huge fan of Ridge, we have a very exciting project that is completely secret still, and I'm not allowed to talk about it at all. But if any of you know our uh, date of um, opening at the Wine Society, you may guess that in 2024, we'll have an exciting project. And I have to say now that Ridge might be involved. So that's uh, something to look forward to for a few <laughs> years. Time. I hope that you all get hold of a little bit of the Montebello that's currently on sale and look out for the Zinfandels in the autumn. As that boat lands, we'll be sure to make sure that we get the wines to you guys in time for Christmas. And uh, a huge thank you to, to you, Eric. I know oh, we've thank you. asked questions to last two or three hours of this uh, Zoom conference. So if it's all right with you, I may email you a few after. Sure, of course, uh, please do. You and I can answer a few extra ones for members. I'm sure they would appreciate it. Of so course, yeah. Thank you for joining us, Eric. It was a pleasure as always. And uh, yes, thank you, Sarah. Either yeah. in the UK or in Santa Cruz very soon. But until then, stay safe. Yeah, you uh, too. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Okay. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Have a lovely evening. Cheers. Or breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yes.